time once again for Community Forum. And we're very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, John Ross. John Ross is author of the new book, Zapatistas, Making Another World Possible, Chronicles of Resistance, 2000 to 2006. So you are just recently back from Mexico. There it was obviously uh, a recent uh, election there. We're just seeing in the last couple days uh, uh, fist fights in their Congress. Uh, tell us about what's going on there. Well, yesterday was <clears throat> the inauguration of the person that was declared president of Mexico, Felipe Calderon, from the right-wing party, the National Action Party, that has actually uh, controlled the uh, Mexican White House for the last six years. Uh, we had an election last July that was probably the most egregious electoral fraud that I have ever imagined in Latin America. And I've been covering electoral fraud for 21 years now out of Mexico City and, and somewhat of that before. This is my fifth Mexican presidential election. Prior to what happened this year, the, the benchmark for fraud in Mexico was the 1988 election, which was stolen from Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas. After the system crashed, that was the government's explanation, <clears throat> for 10 days on election night, and when it came back up, Cardenas had disappeared, and uh, the, the pre-candidate, the man that negotiated NAFTA, Carlos Salinas, was selected and by one per a little over, little less than 1% of, uh, of 50% of the vote. <clears throat> and, we hadn't uh, elections in Mexico because of that great fraud have gotten a lot cleaner over these years. Uh, but this year, everything was up for stake, and we saw the use of the federal electrical electoral authorities, the Federal Electoral Institute, the IFE, distorted and biased in favor of the right wing candidate from the very beginning of the campaign. Me elections are stolen in Mexico before, during, and after the election. So that whole run up to the election was really one a period of increasing bias, um, allowing uh, transnational corporations to buy time on television to display these horrendous hit pieces and the negative campaign has come to Mexico thanks to uh, a U.S. citizen, Fox commentator, guy named Dick Morris, who's been campaigning all over uh, Latin America for the right-wing candidates. Uh, he was active in the Bolivian election against Evo Morales, active recently in the uh, Nicaraguan election against Daniel Ortega, and very active in the Mexican election uh, with these negative hit pieces that became kind of the centerpiece of, of the Calderon campaign in which... Lopez Obrador was labeled right on the screen a uh, danger, un peligro um, to Mexico for six months. Sometimes those commercials appeared four times in one single commercial break on the 10 o'clock news. It's kind of a way of trying to mesmerize Mexicans. And it was always a, a, a shot of Lopez Obrador, the left-wing candidate, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, former, former mayor of Mexico City, and a shot of Hugo Chavez or Subcomandante Marcos or some boogeyman. And then maybe Mexico City falling down, and then the word peligro or danger stamped on the screen. Uh, the federal electoral authorities refused to halt those until the court finally said, this is libelous, you can't do that. And that was like two weeks before the election. Uh, but there are many other examples of this bias that took place in, in that whole period. Election day, we saw some of the most blatant vote stealing that, uh, that I've ever witnessed. And, you know, these were techniques we thought had gone away. But uh, it's very arcane. The party that was in power for seven decades, the pre, kind of developed this whole panel play of dirty tricks. One is called, uh, say, the taco, where you take your ballot and fold it around five pre-marked ballots and drop them slowly into the ballot box, you know, stuffing the ballot box in that way. But And that was actually, we have a lot of videotapes of what happened during that. And then uh, the count after the election was completely distorted again. We had a preliminary count in which three million uh, ballots that were cast were removed because of inconsistencies the way it was defined. Most of those were for Lopez Obrador. When finally Lopez Obrador was successful in uh, getting the tribunal that had to legitimatize the election and, and the right-wing candidate Calderon won by point five eight of 42 million votes cast, about 233,000 votes. When finally they, that tribunal allowed a little less than 10% of the votes to be cast, 
Uh, Lopez Obrador picked up uh, millions of votes. Uh, there were more votes in old than Calderon's uh, margin of victory. And if you extrapolate it out, uh, Cal uh, Lopez Obrador actually won the election by a little more than a million votes, if that sampling can be extrapolated out, less than 9.7 of, uh, of the 130,000 polling places. The, <clears throat> this was an election the U.S. could not lose, um, the transnational corporations could not lose. This was an election in which uh, Mexico's geopolitical standing was up for grabs. It, is Mexico a servile client state of the United States, part of North America? Or, in fact, is its real alliances with the uh, new Latin left? Uh, we have a new Latin left today in Ecuador, actually. Raul Correa having won the election on a Sunday, despite attempts to steal it from him in the first round. Um, and, you know, but uh, this was the big prize. The uh, U.S. And, and Mexico have 3,000 kilometer border. Obviously, we saw these articles in the New York Times. Uh, in the week before the election, New York Times magazine section, as a matter of fact, written by Susan Sontag's son, uh, populist at the border. Populist has become kind of a new word for terrorist. You know, if uh, we look at what Cheney says about Chavez, he equates those terms, populist and terrorist. You know? So, uh, and, and and the, uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, um, intervention in this election was very pronounced. From the embassy, George Bush calls Calderon uh, less than 24 hours after the IFE has declared him the victor in the preliminary count. He calls him from Air Force One, as a matter of fact, you know, to uh, congratulate him on his victory when there was no victory at all. And most of this stuff was timed so that the national and international press would pick it up at 5 o'clock Monday. Uh, everybody writing your articles and going to bed and so on. Tuesday morning, we wake up and the uh, after the election, we wake up and see the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, Washington Post, and the Boston Globe saying, hey, you know, Calderon won this election. Congratulations. So... Anyway, this was indeed the most egregious fraud that I have seen in many a, a year in Latin America, and what has resulted since then is really a, a byproduct of or the end result of this, the bitter fruit of what happened in the stealing of this election. Uh, Lopez Obrador called his people into the street. Uh, three days after the election, he had a half million people. Two weeks after the election, he had a million people. And uh, three weeks after the election, 30 days after the election, he had uh, 2.4 million people in the streets, the largest political demonstration in the history of Mexico. They stayed in the streets, blocked the city for seven weeks, <coughs> acclaimed him as a legitimate president. He was inducted November 20th in this period. Since November 20th, which incidentally is the anniversary of the Mexican Revolution, uh, and December 1st has been one of great fermentation and, and, uh, and street action resistance in Mexico City. The Congress has been sealed off by the military. Three foot high barriers, 5,000 troops, tanks, water, count, uh, water cannons, snipers up on the roofs to keep the people away from the legislature. The uh, deputies that support Lopez Obrador from the three parties that were in his coalition uh, took the tribune, uh, the presidium of Congress, three days before Calderon was to be inaugurated. Uh, the right-wing party, the PAN, also took the tribune and they camped there. They were divided. They fought for three days. Calderon walked into a war zone. This had been going on, actually, for three days. And so yesterday's brawling was just uh, another chapter in this. Uh, the uh, uh, presidential guard, military presidential guard, uh, brought him in through the back of the uh, from the back of the stage, moved him through the part of the stage that was being held by his party people. He went to the microphone. He had to put his own sash on. Uh, he made uh, I think uh, it, I think it's a minute and thirty seconds he spoke, and then they hustled him back out, and he was uh, uh, then inaugurated. He was then the president of Mexico because he had this constitutional commitment to go to Congress to do this. It's a mandate. He had actually been sworn in the previous night by the outgoing President Vicente Fox in the presidential palace before a military guard. There's a voice off camera as, uh, uh, swearing him in. We don't even know who that was. That's the first time that's ever happened in, uh, in, in the history of Mexico in any kind of election where the candidate has been actually sworn in off, off camera or on camera but uh, uh, in a private uh, situation, no? And I think that that scene of him being sworn in on television tells us how Calderon is going to try and rule for the next six years if he makes it. Uh, will essentially be with the military because he was surrounded by the military at that swearing in and with the media. 
And so I think that's really his action plan for the next six years. The country is ungovernable at this moment. We've had all sorts of upheaval uh, for months and months, specifically in Oaxaca. So uh, situation in Oaxaca continues to be uh, uh, very violent. Uh, death squads are roaming the city. Uh, 20 people have been shot down by the death squads in the employ of the governor, Ulysses Ruiz. Uh, we know about Brad Will, Indy Media reporter, 36 years old, slain on the barricades in Santa Lucia, just outside of Oaxaca. But we don't know much about the other 19 people that have been killed by these death squads. They're professors, teachers who have been on strike for many months and members of the Oaxaca Popular Assembly, or the APU. And that situation is a flashpoint. Uh, We have the Zapatista other campaign uh, traveling around the country, organizing uh, points of resistance in communities that usually don't make the map, that aren't really on the grid, you know, and putting together this tapestry of local resistance down below. Mexico is uh, very volatile. Uh, It's a tinderbox at this moment, and we don't get that news. And that's what I'm here doing tomorrow at Elliott Bay uh, Book Company at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, part of the Social Justice uh, Series, uh, along with uh, one of your great local treasures here, uh, Jim Page, a uh, great folk singer. We've worked together before, and we'll be working also on uh, Tuesday night at 8 o'clock at the Wayward Cafe out in the Greenwood District at... Uh, let me see what's the address here. It looks like... Uh, 8570 Greenwood Avenue. Jim Page, John Ross, we're going to bring the house down. So the situation you're seeing now in Mexico, this has been heading in this direction for a long time. Uh, It certainly has been heading in this direction a long time. Things in in Mexico are, you know, we have a country in which 73 million out of 103 million uh, people are living in and around the poverty line. NAFTA has exacerbated the way people are living. It's driven six million farmers and their families off the land as a result of this inundation of bad corn coming in from the U.S., all of it transgenic corn, destroying Mexican corn. Uh, We have this saying in Mexico, you know, no hay país sin maíz, there's no country without corn. And, uh, you know, it's the heart and soul of Mexico, and it's being destroyed by NAFTA and forcing farmers off the land. And they're heading north. They're into the migration stream. That's why we've had 2.4 million people uh, attempt and uh, have crossed the border uh, without papers uh, during the regime of Vicente Fox since 2000. Uh, since NAFTA was signed in uh, 1992 by the first Bush and, and Carlos Salinas, 5,000 Mexicans and Central Americans have died coming across that border uh, uh, to, to take a job that no North American will take. You know, it's more than the World Trade Towers. That's more than the number of uh, troops lost in, uh, in, in, in Iraq, although the Iraqis have lost 650,000 people. No? Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the effects have been nefarious. People are poor. And uh, neoliberalism in the form of NAFTA has really been the cause of this, as it has been all throughout Latin America. And all throughout Latin America, people have risen up against neoliberalism and the lack of protection, the privatization of their natural resources, of their phone companies, their health system, their transportation systems. And they've elected left-center presidents, uh, social democrats from uh, Terra del Fuego on up to the Mexican border, and indeed, they elected a uh, Social Democrat left-leaning candidate, Andres Manuel López Obrador, last July, and they stole the election away from him. So, you've been following the Zapatista movement. So, where do you see that movement heading now? The Zapatista movement is, you know, sui genero. It's its own. It's its own thing. It's a very unorthodox rebellion. And after now we're in our thirteenth year, we'll celebrate that January first. Is real distinct, but I think it's a new way of doing things. And basically, it uh, it deals with autonomy, communalism, getting off the government grid, constructing your own infrastructure, taking charge of your own life. Uh, taking charge of your own school curriculum, taking charge of your own health care system, uh, finding a way to finance that. They're doing it through organic coffee, buy Zapatista coffee, um, and, you know, building a- another world. And that really is the title of, of the story, you know. Uh, uh, and it is a story. I'm a storyteller, and this book is a story. Um, the, the, uh, the subtitle, Making Another World Possible, borrows... Uh, that phrase that we use all the time uh, began at Seattle right here in 1999 
you know, after demonstrations, another world is possible. And what we've seen, uh, the South Batista continuum these last six years has been essentially to build that other world, making that other world with their backs and their wheelbarrows and their calloused hands and their good hearts putting together uh, this other world, which is possible. So you see them as an example for what is starting to, well, what has been happening in this country for a long time, but seems to be picking up some uh, its pace. Yeah, I, I'm really impressed by what I've seen. I, I've been on tour since um, the beginning of October, uh, from border to border and a bit beyond because I've been in British Columbia, as a matter of fact, just recently. And, uh, you know, I speak to audiences of people that are interested in the Zapatista phenomena and Mexico and and, uh, and uh, general uh, people south of the border. A, and a, mainly to audiences of, of Mexicans in the U.S., Chicano activists here, and uh, to leftists, and specifically a lot to anarchists. And I really see this 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 coming together of those three forces: Mexican and Chicano activists, and uh, uh, and and anarchists from one place to another. In one struggle after another, South Central Farms in Los Angeles, for example, last spring's immigration marches, um, whatever is local, and it's become kind of the prevailing thinking within this movement that was once a solidarity movement that provided old clothes for the Zapatistas is now basically one that says, be a Zapatista where you are. Work on local issues. Don't be attached or, or imprisoned by these uh, old, old left ideologies, you know, find new ways of building coalitions, get off the government grid, take charge of your own life, you know, stand up with your brothers and sisters all over the world in Latin America in solidarity because that's where our allegiance are too. And I, it's very optimistic in a in a very in a world that seems darker and darker all the time. Uh, it's a very optimistic stroke to see this uh, this coalition developing this space. And it really does. It works on a lot of different issues, but it really does come together through uh, the the whole Zapatista concept of of taking charge of your own life. And do you see this resurgence uh, primarily coming from young people, or is it people across the board? No, I, it is primarily young people. I'm 70 years old, and I'm a veteran in here. I'm kind of a, I always call myself the Willie Loman of the Zapatista Army of National Liberation, because I'm always lugging those suitcases full of books around. Uh, but, you know, kind of a grandpa in this situation, I guess. But it's really interesting to see some of the things that are happening and that I've run into along the line here on the, on the run is that at three different formations. One is the New Black Panther Party, chaired by the chairman is Fred Hampton Jr., whose father was slaughtered by the Chicago police way back when in 1969. Uh, another is the New Brown Berets, uh, specifically in Watsonville, California, a, a Mexican city with a long history of resistance and, and rebellion. Um, but the Brown Berets have become a phenomenon throughout California. And I was just at Lewis and Clark in Portland for the uh, Northwest Meeting of Students for a Democratic Society, or revival of SDS. Now, you might say these names are a little bit uh, retro, but young people, I think, are reaching back to try and, uh, you know, try and utilize and revive those structures and uh, put those, you know, put them back together again. And there's certainly plenty to work on uh, in this country right now. And it seems especially courageous to be reviving those particular groups, given the current climate here in the U.S. with the Department of Homeland Security and the current uh, paintbrush of environmental groups that do direct actions, painting them as terrorists. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, the whole Green Scare thing, which was a major uh, part of the SDS conference, it took place in Portland. Portland's been a center of this. I think that's only natural. But uh, I, I don't know uh, if we have many options. You know, one of the things about this country is that it provides this gamut of options that can divert us from what the goal is and from what we're trying to achieve, which is a just society. And most of them are personal options. You know, uh, you know the ability to choose to go to uh, uh, the 
first round of a new movie rather than go to a vigil out here in Westlake, say, at Westlake Shopping Center every Thursday night where women in black meet. You know? So, you know, we need to make those personal sacrifices and narrow down the superfluous options in this society. But really, the international situation and the national situation is such that we really don't have much option but to resist uh, the stuff that's coming down. And, uh, I, you know, I realize I'm speaking on a station that uh, espouses the Air America way of doing things, but uh, the, the truth is that there isn't much difference between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. It's one party with two heads. And so everyone that was elated by uh, this, uh, the victory of in, in, in November uh, ought to really take a, a second look at where we are, you know, a couple of weeks or three weeks after that, you know, first day after the election, Nancy Pelosi took impeachment off the table, as did John Conyers. And that's the left of the party, John Conyers. And uh, in that sense, I think that, you know, uh, we have to make that a, a, a collective decision. You know? and we have to be in the street. San Francisco, I was, uh, I was happy to see a number of hundreds of people in the street outside Pelosi's office the day after the election. We can vote. I'm not against voting. I think that it's a poor measure of democracy. Voting is, you know, is, uh, elections are bought and sold, whether it's here or there. What we're seeing in the, in the Florida district, Kathleen Harris, this old district is really an indication that the uh, electoral fraud crosses border, whether it's a triple barrier fence there or not, you know. And so we're seeing this again: eighteen thousand votes lost, uh, you know, in the state where Kathleen Harris committed these egregious acts of fraud. So, uh, but. That's voting, you know. Then we need to be able to present our force in the street, present our actions, our, our plans, uh, and impress upon our representatives in legislatures that they have an obligation to the people. And that's what's missing in this, in this equation here, that we need to have that public pressure from the street all the time. And uh, we're in the belly of the beast, so it's harder to do that. And again, so many options. But, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I think that social action is good for folks, good for your soul. You know, it gets you out there in the street. You get a lot of exercise that way, you know. Us old people can get out there and, you know, kind of walk around like we, you know, like we need to do. You know, it gets our blood running. I have to read the New York Times every morning to get my blood running, you know. It's like, you know, because the lies that, that fill those pages, you know, really get me up. So... Uh, so, yeah, I, you know, I advise it, I counsel it, and uh, I urge everybody to be in the street whenever you can. Yeah, it seems like one of the things we could be importing from, uh, from Latin America is that spirit of uh, taking to the streets. Well, yeah, sure. And that's, you know, what I've done for years and years and years in Mexico reporting is really to try and bring that concept, that, uh, that ethos of public participation in politics, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, folks here on the other side of the triple barrier now. And uh, it really, by example, uh, to incite some rebellion here. Now, sometimes I've been successful uh, on certain issues and on other issues. People have just uh, uh, gone on and uh, disregarded uh, some egregious injustice that might have occurred. But uh, the truth is that it's been uh, my responsibility. I, you know, I'm, I've been a freelance journalist for almost 50 years and uh, most of the time spent in Latin America. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a marginal life, you know. I always tell J school students and I've got, you know, doing some J school stuff now is that they forget it. They don't have a career in journalism. Journalism is not a career builder, you know. What they have is an obligation to report the truth an obligation to their sources, an obligation to get the story out. In Mexico, we call that position oficio. It's kind of the position that you have within a village or within a town, the oficio of responsibility. So uh, I think that's, you know, I think that's, we need to have more reporters like myself <laughs> that feel that they have a responsibility to the story and to getting that information out in whatever way. We're blocked a lot in terms of getting it out in the print media and now less print, more electronic uh, and more and more uh, cybernetics. No, but uh, we often have a difficult time to get that stuff into the corporate press. The corporate press doesn't want to hear it. Corporate press has an obligation to corporations. No, and so we have to find and devise other ways of getting that truth out. Sometimes I do it in poetry. I will, in fact, be presenting uh, some of this information in poetry with my latest chapbook, 
Bomba. Uh, here it is with a big bomb on the cover. On, are we on public access? There we go. Bomba. And these are poems that I bring back from uh, um, the Middle East mainly, mainly, but also from Latin America. I've been working a lot in Middle East on Middle East stuff, basically Iraq. We went to Iraq as uh, human shields back in 2003. Uh, and in Palestine, picking olives. And uh, in Turkey, just recently, working with draft resistors to, uh, uh, to a very militarized system. And in other places and other hotspots in the Middle East. So, uh, it, you know, the, out, one of the, the way I work is that the outtakes of my stories are often poems where I notice things that don't kind of fit into the story but seem to have a certain poetry to them. And all of these stories have music to them. And I listen to that music and I write poems from that music. So, And you had mentioned uh, personal choices and uh, also I know from our conversation here that you know you're not you're not getting rich from any of this you've published numerous books but um the the money doesn't seem to like find its way back to you from that so one of the ways that people can support you is to turn out to these events and purchase your books there at the events that's one way to do it and you know i you know money is just something we use to eat to tell you the truth and i've been stuck down here in the days in here for a country i'm sorry i've plug something here for a bunch of days so that does you know kind of offset the 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 kind of traveling around cost that i have and uh but we don't get rich you know and until i got old i didn't have any kind of health care you know and uh so in, in a real sense this is a dangerous business brad will being shot down in the barricades in, in oaxaca just a month ago uh really brings it home uh, we have a lot of independent journalists that are suffering the same fate. fate. I, I want to plug here uh, a young man named Josh Wolf, who will break the record uh, as to the number of the amount of time he has spent in federal prison for refusing to turn up, turn over his sources video of a anti-globalization demonstration that took place in the Mission District in San Francisco last summer. Uh, he's already been in jail for 100 days. The courts have refused to entertain any new appeals, and he will be in jail through July. That will break uh, any existing record of any reporter that's been imprisoned and, and certainly bypassed by a long shot. Uh, the notorious Judas Miller, who did about 85 days, I think, in jail, uh, you know, for not for the crime of reporting 11 mendacious front page stories about how Saddam had weapons of mass destruction but for refusing to turn over the name of some uh, unknown neocom who had told her that uh, uh, Joe Wilson's wife was a CIA agent. No? So, you know, Josh Wolf uh, lived like him. He's been in jail for uh, a long time and will be through July. Josh Wolf, Rod, uh, Rod Will, they're examples of a younger generation that are doing this independent reporting who feel this obligation, this responsibility to get the story out. And uh, I think we owe a, a great debt to them. All right. Well, with that, we're unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming in this morning. Okay. Thank you for having me.